Thank you, Rachel. Um, welcome, everybody. If you feel comfortable to put your camera on, um, obviously, if you don't, that's fine. But uh, we welcome if you want to share, share your face with us, we would like that too. So welcome, everybody. I'm Melinda from the University of Queensland in Australia. And I begin, I swear, and I begin this roundtable by acknowledging that the land I speak to you from today is the land of the Yagara and Turbal people, Australia's First Nations people, whose land was never ceded. In January this year, German judges in the High Regional Court of Koblenz found Anwar A, a former member of the Syrian Secret Service, guilty of crimes against humanity in the form of killing, torture, serious deprivation of liberty, rape and sexual assault, in combination with murder in 27 cases. The first of its kind against the senior leader of the Syrian government, Anwar A, was given a life sentence for his role in the widespread and systematic oppression of the civilian opposition by Syrian government forces in the wake of the Arab Spring. It was a small but important first step for Syrian witnesses and victims of atrocity crimes since 2011. Yet, as the European Centre for Constitutional and Human Rights stated in response to the judgment, this verdict is not only for the Syrians affected by the crimes of the Assad regime, but it is also a trial and a verdict made possible by them. Indeed, private non-state actors, most particularly, most particularly the witnesses and victims of Syrian crimes, played an essential role by adopting the practices ordinarily associated with the offices of international prosecutors to hold those most responsible to account. In 2011, they have attempted, since 2011, they have attempted to close the accountability gap left firstly by the Syrian local judiciary and thereafter as international efforts failed or remained unavailable. With few options available for accountability, one of the groups that have worked alongside Syrians to pursue accountability in a foreign court is the Berlin-based group, the European Centre for Constitutional and Human Rights based in Berlin. Indeed, they played a central role working alongside hundreds of Syrians to identify witnesses and victims of core crimes. And I recall when I was in Berlin in 2019, Christian Richter, then head of the war crimes section of the Federal Public Prosecutor General's Office in Germany, explaining the role that the European Centre for Constitutional and Human Rights had played in providing a trusted intermediary role with Syrians to provide witness statements and victim statements to the German legal authorities, many of which later played a role in the Anwarka case. The European Centre for Constitutional and Human Rights also encouraged the German court, in the case of Anwar R, to include sexual crimes in the case. Patrick Croker, who is on our roundtable today and a member of the team at the European Centre for Constitutional and Human Rights, was also lawyer to the co-plaintiffs in the Anwar R case. Another group that played an essential role was the Commission for International Justice and Accountability, often referred to as CEJA. One of the key members of CEJA is Chief Investigator One, a Syrian investigator who remains anonymous for security reasons. Chief Investigator One was witness to the earliest crimes of the Syrian regime. And later, he along with William Wiley and many others became founding members of the CEJA. Along with his Syrian-based investigations team, Chief Investigator One collected material in, in Syria focusing on material produced by the Syrian government with the purpose of later identifying documents that link those most responsible to the underlying crimes following a, a Nuremberg model. Seizure also played a role in the trial of Anwar R by amongst other things, submitting the documents they collected to the Higher Regional Court of Koblenz. Tarek Abdullah, who is here with us today, will explain his role in helping to prepare the initial criminal brief when he worked at Seizure with the material collected by Chief Investigator One and his team as they continued to work in the field and as war in Syria ensued. In addition to this, non-state actors have examined other options for accountability for Syria. For example, in September last year, the Netherlands informed Syria by diplomatic note that they intended to hold the Syrian government responsible under international law for gross human rights violations and torture in particular. Minister of Foreign Affairs Steph Block stated then that the Assad regime 
had committed horrific crimes time after time, and that the evidence was overwhelming, and that there must be consequences. Ibrahim Alawi is part of the legal team Guernica 37, advising the Netherlands on the first case, which may end up before the International Court of Justice against Syria, for torture. And if it did, it would follow a similar case in the case of Hussein Habre in Belgium versus Senegal, which later led to the indictment of Habre in Senegal for crimes against humanity, amongst other crimes. I also note that Guernica 37 also helped file a criminal complaint against senior leaders for crimes in Syria, for crimes against humanity in the Spanish court on behalf of a victim's sister. It's also made submissions concerning the situation in Syria and Jordan with the International Criminal Court. In the case of Anwar R, it also raises the question as to how governments, such as the German government, have played a unique role in empowering their judiciary in the process of accountability. As one of the broadest examples of universal jurisdiction in the world next to Norway, German legal authorities have been proactively investigating alleged crimes committed in Syria since the Arab Spring. At one point, the German courts issued an extradition request for General Jamil Hassan, head of Syria's Air Force Intelligence in 2019 for crimes against humanity. It eliminates the role governments can play to empower their judiciary to pursue core crimes, exercising universal jurisdiction in accordance with the international laws that govern them, including the conventions they sign, such as the Convention Against Torture, as well as customary international law. It highlights how governments can and do work with private non-state actors, particularly witness and victims of core international crimes, both working alongside each other adopting the practices that lead to accountability. In short, the case of Anwar R shines light on the interdisciplinary and multiplicity of actors, institutions and means involved in closing the accountability gap. Today, Yuna, who joins us also on the round table, has worked on the normative aspects of universal jurisdiction in light of the Eichmann trial. And Yuna will provide her insight into how international relations informs criminal accountability processes more broadly. So one of the key questions for us today is what are the lessons learned that can be taken from the Anwar R case? And how can these lessons inform accountability in, in other instances, such as the war in Ukraine and with respect to the Yazidi people? With this in mind, it is an enormous, enormous honor to introduce our speakers for the round table today. First, Patrick Croker. Patrick is a German qualified lawyer and legal advisor in the International Crimes and Accountability Program at the European Center for Constitutional and Human Rights in Berlin. In particular, he focuses on cases involving universal jurisdiction. Previously, he was assistant to civil party lawyers at the extraordinary chambers in the courts of Cambodia. Next, Tariq Adula. Currently, Tariq is Crown Prosecutor in Australia. Previously, he worked for the Commission for International Justice and Accountability concerning the case against the Syrian government. Before that, Tariq was Prosecutor at the Extraordinary Chambers in the Courts of Cambodia, and he worked in Bosnia-Herzegovina as an advisor to the President of an internationalized court for war crimes and organized crime. Third, Ibrahim Alabi. Ibrahim is a barrister at Guernica 37 Chambers in the UK and founder of the Syrian Legal Development Program. Recently, Ibrahim delivered a speech to the United Nations Security Council on the status of accountability for Syria. Lastly, Yuna Han. Yuna is lecturer in international relations in the Department of Politics and International Relations at the University of Oxford and affiliated with St. Catherine's College. Her research focuses on the politics of international law, focusing on international criminal law and human rights accountability. We begin this round table with Patrick. Patrick, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Melinda. Um, and thank you very much also for the invitation to speak here uh, and, uh, and hi everyone. Um, I want to um, pick up on some points that you have already mentioned, Melinda, in your introductory words. Um, 
mainly I would say four four topics that fall under the overall topic of the lessons learned of this trial against Anwar R in Germany. Um, one is investigative capacity. Two is participation by civil society. I want to speak a little bit about outreach of these trials and accessibility. Um, and then I want to speak also a little bit about the favorable political circumstances. Um, so maybe to start with, you have mentioned uh, my role and our role in these proceedings. Um, it's work that we have started um, with the ECCHR more than 15 years ago by now. Um, actually, the Code of uh, Crimes Against International Law in Germany um, will have its uh, 20th anniversary, so to say, in several weeks. Uh, it was established right uh, after the Rome Statute um, came into force. And um, we can say that there was a big shift in universal jurisdiction practice, I would say, not only in Germany, uh, but also in other countries, uh, something that maybe, you know, goes beyond a little bit, um, uh, maybe my, my first intervention here, maybe something to keep in mind, however, uh, that there was uh, quite some shifts in universal jurisdiction practice, but also universal jurisdiction policy around the world that is also reflected uh, in legislative changes uh, that came about um, in order to limit the possibilities, possibilities of UJ. However, in Germany, it was always... Um, in a legal sense, very widely possible and is now also pretty heavily applied. Um, and I think one of the most important takeaways or lessons learned from the Koblenz trial is something that beforehand was not really that clear, at least to the legal community in Germany, but maybe also beyond, is that these cases are actually possible. Um, there was always, uh, you know, the doubt that it might overwhelm uh, the uh, national um, jurisdictions, the courts, the prosecutors, etc. Uh, and we had a very famous first trial here in Germany under this Code of International Crimes um, that was about an FDLR, the FDLR and a militia that is active in, in Eastern Congo um, that lasted for five years. Um, and uh, that really no one was uh, was satisfied with where the presiding judge ended, sorry, started the uh, the the handing out of the verdict uh, on the last day with the words, it doesn't work this way, uh, which was quite, quite famous. And now we kind of have the counter proof by not only Koblenz, but also you mentioned the other, you know, the genocide. We have a, the first verdict of genocide against the Yazidi population um, by a trial just 150 kilometers from Koblenz weeks before. Uh, and another one opened just very recently. So the first takeaway, very importantly, is universal jurisdiction cases are possible if the setup is right, if they're being done right. Uh, and that's why we want to take this further now and, and um, extend it to only to, to other countries as well, but also to other situations. You mentioned Ukraine, uh, and there's certainly a lot more uh, that are possible. Um, now, coming back to the points uh, that I mentioned that I want to touch upon, why is this possible? Why has this been uh, what I would call also a, uh, a success uh, in, in all humbleness, so to say? Um, first of all, there is an investigative capacity. These investigations, I mean, you know, probably everybody here uh, in, this, uh, in this virtual room knows that these are very difficult investigations to have. Um, and something that was lacking and still is lacking in many countries in the world are special units by the prosecution authorities. If you're a prosecutor and you have never investigated or prosecuted these cases, you're going to have a very difficult time. And there was a long learning and a very steep learning curve in Germany by the federal prosecutors. Um, and there's really, you know, a very, it's, it's, it's a very close parallel of where special units exist and where these cases can be successfully brought. Uh, a kind of counter example to this is Austria, where there is a very strong case uh, that is uh, supported also by uh, the esteemed colleagues of CJA very much uh, and others, um, but uh, that is not being handled by a specialized prosecutor and we don't see uh, the results that we are all hoping for. Um, another very important uh, aspect of these trials um, is that they are very innovative initiatives that are supporting these investigations. Um, you have mentioned CJA and, and certainly their role in Koblenz, but also in many other prosecutions and investigations is really pivotal. Uh, there is also the IIIM, which is a very interesting um, example, the mechanism for the investigation uh, of crimes in Syria set up by the General Assembly. 
Um, and we see this now in one, in some way, spilling over also to other uh, situations. There is the accountability platform for Belarus, for example, where civil society actors got together in order to establish a platform to collect and preserve evidence before the states or the General Assembly, uh, which very often are a bit slower to react, obviously, uh, can do this kind of work. And obviously, you, with Ukraine, we have seen these efforts, uh, at least by now, these websites where people can upload uh, the documentation that they have, um, irrespective now of how useful that might be one day in the future. But nevertheless, we see that there is a lot of innovative thinking going on, uh, and that is very important to support these universal jurisdiction cases. Um, second point, you've also mentioned that, Melinda, very important is the participation by civil society, especially Syrian civil society. I think that was one of the main reasons why this was even possible. You said it yourself, our role also with the ECCHR is uh, not only to do it for survivors, but to put survivors and Syrian organizations in the position that they are actually the ones driving this. Um, and I think this is so important because you have all these amazing Syrian activists and individuals, some of us, uh, you know, among here, even on the panel, um, but also other organizations doing everything from documentation. Uh, you have people and organizations working with survivors or themselves being victims and survivors who can in continental legal systems join cases as active victim participants or, or co-plaintiffs as we called them in Koblenz, um, which was amazingly important because it gave us the opportunity, for example, uh, to bring in a very important aspect of uh, the crimes in Syrian detention facilities, uh, which is sexualized violence, which had not been indicted by the federal prosecutor. And we, as the victim's lawyers, filed an application for it to be included as a crime against humanity. Um, and then it was actually, Anwar R was, was convicted for that. Uh, but also in, in very, very other various aspects. Um, for me personally, to see my clients, five of them, to give closing arguments in court, standing there in front of the panel of judges, only two meters away from the accused to their right, uh, was definitely one of the most powerful moments of my, of my career and really, uh, for me personally, also one of the most important days of this trial. Um, but also this goes you know, to other disciplines that I think are really important to make uh, trials like this a success meaning you know journalists artists uh, researchers that are there that have you know also access to uh, what is happening in the trial and that can multiply it and also uh, bring it into other uh, spheres so to say of society because if these trials are going to have an impact then we need to think beyond uh, the law which sometimes is difficult for us as lawyers so we need other uh, professionals from other disciplines to do that with us and for us um that brings me to my third point, that is outreach and accessibility, especially you know, for people that have been affected uh, by it. And that is definitely something, uh, a really big point to criticize, um, especially in Germany. It looks better in other countries that are pursuing universal jurisdiction. Um, in Germany there, we had to really fight hard uh, that even accredited journalists uh, get, um, for example, uh, access to the translation device that was there anyways in Arabic. Um, to name but one example. So there is a lot to do, a lot to improve uh, on that side uh, by authorities, because it is important that these trials are accessible for everyone and especially by people uh, that are affected by it. And that means as a national court, you need to think beyond uh, your normal constituency. You need to, th to think about providing information material um, to, to, uh, it, to other languages and, and to other people as well. And this is something uh, that is clearly lacking in, in Germany and this lack is very visible. Again, here, civil society organizations try to fill this gap, um, including us with the ECCHR. I think also there we were in a way successful. Uh, we have, for example, a compendium of the trial in Koblenz with hundreds of pages of documentation about the trial. Uh, so far only translated to Arabic and then obviously uh, available also in German. Uh, we're working also to have it out in English. Obviously, Arabic was, was more important to us to start with. Um, but it's not a private task. It's not something that you should dump on civil society. Um, the ICC is doing a much better job with that. And I think national jurisdictions should also think that, have that on their mind when they talk about uh, pursuing these trials. Last but not least, uh, just a quick word on the favorable political circumstances that we have. 
um, it's important to remind ourselves that so far, uh, you know, to put it in, in uh, Maximo Langer, the scholar's words, uh, that we do have, uh, you know, more weak targets, uh, so to say, uh, of these prosecution uh, and uh, that, uh, you know, suspects from strong states still have a lot of uh, possibility to avoid um, prosecution also by universal jurisdiction. Um, and we would like to see a more active practice on that side. We do see that there are double standards being applied. If you're somebody from a politically in the West, at least weak country like Syria, it is much easier that, uh, that to bring these cases than uh, if you're from a powerful uh, country um, like the US, like Russia, uh, or if you're a German uh, person that contributed as a businessman uh, or woman uh, to these crimes. Um, but nevertheless, uh, we think that it's still very important that this went ahead. Uh, and also that the more powerful people in Syria are on the agenda of prosecutors. I think that is also something not to be forgotten, something that we work for very hard in, in the first years when we started this work, uh, which culminated in the arrest warrant against Jamil Hassan in Germany, and then following also arrest warrants from France. Um, and then obviously this is something also, if we want these universal jurisdiction um, first successful steps to matter and, and to resonate more, I think it's important to go after the highest level of responsibility. That means following up on arrest warrants, uh, tracing you know, where powerful people are traveling, but it also means that what, what we have learned in these processes needs to be transferred uh, also to other situations such as Ukraine. I will stop here, thank you. Thank you so much, Patrick, that was, that was really good. Um, Tariq, the floor is yours. Thank you, Melinda, and um, thank you for the invitation and the opportunity to um, participate in, in this discussion. Um, what I might do is uh, just to build on uh, the very impressive uh, overviews uh, from Melinda and Patrick is give an example perhaps of how CJA, the Commission for International Justice and Accountability that I worked for in 2014, 16 and 17, um, uh, contributed, hopefully, to the collection, cataloging, um, uh, and preparation of material, and ultimately briefs, which um, uh, have fed into some of these prosecutions, including the case of Anwar R in, in Germany. Um, it's an interesting model, I think, um, and I know Melinda's written about this a lot, uh, because it is, uh, um, offers, I wouldn't say an alternative, but perhaps a a complementing or a complementary mechanism uh, which can step in um, and, and offer a service which perhaps the more established um, state or international agencies are unable to offer whilst a, um, a conflict is ongoing. And what do I mean by all, all those words? Well, um, we heard um, in the last few days that the prosecutor of the International Criminal Court is on the ground in Ukraine speaking to the president of the Ukraine, which I think is a wonderful um, and perhaps the precedent, I'm not sure that it's ever happened before, so far. in fact, we're the first and hopefully not the last of its kind where the international agencies are engaging with uh, those actors on the ground who are prepared and willing to, to, to facilitate access to crime scenes, witnesses, et cetera, documentation, et cetera. Um, but there's a, 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 a big difference between those kind of efforts at a very high level and, and actual uh, collection of evidence, um, uh, it's processing, uh, preparation of briefs, etc. cetera. Um, it wouldn't come as a shock to most of the participants in this panel who are seasoned professionals that um, agencies such as the International Criminal Court and the United Nations are not likely to expose their staff, investigators, analysts, etc., to high risk environments, such as, for example, presently exists in Ukraine or in the case of CJA, um, as was the case in Syria um, from around 2011 onwards. Um, so agencies such as CJA, uh, it seems to me, um, have a role to play, among other things, in um, perhaps the fact that they have, one, a higher tolerance in terms of risk, their capacity to access crime scenes. Um, they are more nimble, uh, they are cheaper than large international organisations and perhaps arguably able to respond in a more timely fashion. Um, CJA essentially, um, uh, without again telling everyone on this panel things that people already know, uh, was able to collect and extract out of Syria close to about a million 
pages of Syrian government documentation. Um, that documentation was largely obtained through uh, various opposition uh, groups and forces that, uh, that were able to extract uh, that, that documentation from various places around Syria, from Ba'ath Party officers, from government agency officers, from um, security agency officers, etc. That documentation was collected, brought uh, to uh, various European capitals where it was um, uh, carefully processed, scanned, catalogued, registered, uh, eventually translated and analyzed, and then fed into a large, um, a couple of large databases, which are designed to be com as compatible as possible with the existing precedents in terms of what international tribunals uh, tend to employ in um, marshalling large um, uh, libraries or archives of this kind of material. So Siege uh, was able to get into Syria, including um, in, by employing people such as the person that Melinda referred to, investigators who exposed themselves in some cases to significant risk. Um, um, they were able to extract the documentation, they were able to access witnesses, uh, both witnesses who uh, had been victims of some of the um, atrocities in Syria, but also in some cases, people who were what might broadly be described as insiders, people who, were, uh, who had been part of the regime or one of the agencies and were prepared to, to provide statements um, to seizure investigators. Um, so, you know, what we're really building up towards is a, is a kind of investigative model, uh, not just a, a, an agency that extracts the documentation out of the um, very risky environment, but also professionally treats that documentation and then seeks to speak to witnesses who can inform an understanding of that documentation and the events on the ground. Um, what of course is important in a process such as that, uh, and I appreciate I'm just describing one um, out of what is a series of different ways in which this could be done. And I acknowledge there are various types of actors that can perform useful functions in, this, in these kind of processes. So, but just sticking with the CJA model, um, what I think was um, done well, uh, and certainly every model has room for improvement and uh, it can, can be usefully scrutinised and criticised. But one thing that was done well, I think, was that the agency sought to set up a, uh, an internal staffing and structure um, by employing professionals, people who, um, and getting back to the point Patrick made, um, it's important in these processes as much as you can to marshal experience, to have the appropriate training, to have personnel who are able to deal um, with the complexities that these types of cases bring. So CJA had within its um, uh, structure, uh, former analysts, investigators, lawyers, prosecutors, judicial uh, people who had worked with, them, with, with judicial officers, et cetera, from various international tribunals. So there was a body of, of professional people who had done this kind of work before, understood the importance um, that, that attaches to um, careful uh, processing of the records um, and, and hopefully uh, approach the process of analyzing the material in a kind of forensic way that would ultimately meet um, the, the demands of, of a, whether it be a, a domestic court, such as uh, in the case of Anwar Ha in Germany, or hopefully an international or internationalized tribunal if one is established for Syria. Um, the uh, briefs I worked on um, were a series of legal briefs uh, which uh, sought to um, analyze the available documentation uh, uh, and, and, and deal with um, specific types of criminality that were alleged. And as it turns out, the core criminality or the core um, category of events we were dealing were indeed the type of events that uh, Anwar Ha was prosecuted for, and that is mass arrests, imprisonment, uh, extrajudicial imprisonment, uh, followed by torture, enforced disappearances, um, mass murder of either actual or perceived uh, regime dissidents. Uh, so there was a, um, a countrywide brief which, which dealt with all of the key agencies of the Syrian regime, including the four security agencies. And then there were regional briefs dealing with um, most, if not all of the, and I say, if not all, because I left a couple of years ago, um, of the governorates of Syria, um, looking to identify specific locations where uh, atrocities were committed, um, uh, to identify people and agencies that may be responsible, to catalogue, uh, as I said earlier, 
uh, all of that information and hopefully to make it accessible. Um, I, I can't uh, um, claim to have had any involvement in the collaboration between CJA and general authorities and people such as Patrick in terms of the Anwar R prosecution, but I understand that uh, a senior CJA uh, official uh, was a witness in that trial uh, and that there was extensive collaboration in terms of documentation and the like. So perhaps a, an illustration in practice of how that model can complement real uh, or eventual prosecution in, in, in this case, the National Tribunal. Um, I might stop there and I'm happy to uh, obviously answer questions later on if, if people have um, various areas they wish to canvas in more detail. Thank you, Tarek. Um, and we're just waiting for Ibrahim. So I think, Yuna, did you want to did you want to start? Sure, I can I can stop in while we wait for Ibrahim. Um, so uh, thank you, Melinda, for preparing this and, and putting us all together. And thanks, Patrick and Tarek, for such interesting uh, comments before me. I think I'm going to take a slight step back to kind of paint what I think is sort of the overall kind of political climate uh, regarding uh, these types of uh, prosecutions going forward, and a little bit uh, focus more on a point that Patrick. Uh, mentioned earlier about sort of domestic outreach and, and, and access when it comes to uh, the, uh, the trials. So I think it is fair to say that it's increasingly looking like the um, universal jurisdiction prosecutions, particularly by states in which the, the by third party states, is becoming a much more kind of in the forefront of uh, accountability for grave international crimes. And I'd like to emphasize the fact that this is not because it provides this kind of mechanism of accountability provides an absolute advantage over kind of other mechanisms that we have, or because the political climate for, for universal jurisdiction is particularly more amenable in a global sense. Of course, there's kind of countrywide variation here, but rather it's a kind of a relative advantage that it has insofar as the international climate for international accountability has been declining as a lot of people on this panel and in this, in this virtual room might be aware of. And it's not necessarily looking like it's going to improve anytime soon. At the same time, I think the, the kind of, as Patrick pointed out, the fact that we've proven, or at least people have proven in certain countries that these kinds of grave international crimes can be prosecuted domestically. That kind of precedent, I think, has a catalyzing effect of uh, in terms of the interest towards universal jurisdiction. So just to kind of paint the picture of the international climate, um, if we look at the current situation with the Russian invasion in Ukraine, there are lots of voices that seem to suggest that there is a revived interest in uh, international accountability mechanisms. Right, so we have uh, so far that I've counted 41 member states of the International Criminal Court that have referred the situation in Ukraine to the prosecutor. Right, this is a record breaking uh, referral, and we don't see these kind of third country referrals in, in mass in the ICC before. So, this seems to suggest that the mood has changed from the much more kind of cautious and uh, slightly antagonistic relationship the ICC was having with uh, member states uh, in the past couple of years. At the same time, we've had a recent sort of high level um, proposal spearheaded by the likes of former U uh, UK Prime Minister Gordon Brown, member of the UN, UN International Law Commission, that for Kanda, Ben Ferenc, asking for a specific ad hoc tribunal of sorts uh, for the crime of aggression in particular um, in the context of the Russian invasion. Now, all of these very public and high profile appeals um, while su suggesting that the political climate might be changing is really up against very kind of real material and political um, uh, opposition as well. I note the fact that despite the fact that we have such great number of uh, third state referrals for the Ukraine case, there's really no uh, kind of discernible movement from member states to, for example, increase the material support that the International Criminal Court is going to get, right? So this is a lot of really great rhetoric and a lot of potentially political will, but we haven't seen it yet being translated into kind of real term commitments from these states. At the same time, if we kind of think about the proposed ad hoc tribunal, for example, you know, it, it, it's already getting a lot of pushback, both in terms of academic spheres as well as kind of practitioners. But, you know, leaving those oppositions aside, it is very difficult to see what is going to be the political mechanism through which this ad hoc tribunal is going to be established 
given the composition of the Security Council. So we're sort of assuming that there will be some kind of total military victory against Russia that will allow us to somehow change the entire political climate in one go, which I do think is fairly um, implausible and the point of time that we stand here today. So given this kind of international climate, I think increasingly we're seeing a turn towards universal jurisdiction by uh, cases by, by domestic courts. And, um, and at the same time, kind of if we take that kind of political climate at face value, it not only means that domestic courts uh, will be taking on, most likely will be taking on uh, international crimes uh, because it's kind of left as its last resort, but also we're looking at a situation where um, cases will be coming forward as the conflict situation itself continues in, in the home country or the conflict country. So there's no kind of resolution. So in an ongoing situation, there'll be accountability alongside uh, um, happening simultaneously in a different country. And we're looking at situations in which accountability is being pursued without meaningful regime change in the country that is kind of committing these crimes. Right. So this is kind of the situation in Syria where third countries are taking on these uh, processes without necessarily meaningful uh, regime change or kind of the resolution of the conflict on the ground. This is a continuation and an exacerbation, I think, of existing trends in international accountability as well as transitional justice more broadly. But we're simply seeing that being taken away from the international realm into kind of dispersed into disaggregated um, domestic courts. That's kind of the political picture that I wanted to uh, uh, paint as a backdrop. I think this raises kind of interesting questions about who are the constituent audiences of these international trials and therefore who, who we need to be thinking about in terms of the questions of access and outreach. And I think the kind of very easy answer is of course victims, right? But here I want to kind of uh, focus a little bit more on what we actually mean by that and what would, what, how that would translate into kind of practical steps going forward. I think the idea that uh, domestic courts will be taking a much larger role in accountability for international crimes in a con context where the conflict is continuing and there is no meaningful regime change in the country of kind of commission of the crimes suggest uh, that we need to be thinking about these uh, prosecutions, not only as a state carrying out international obligations, so as an international event writ large, but also as a domestic event, right? Domestic political event, insofar as it needs to be responding to and reaching out to its domestic constituent audience. And here we can mean very directly in terms of the victims who are residing within these countries, either as refugees or immigrants and, and, uh, and diaspora communities, which has always taken, and particularly in the case of Syria, taken a very outsized role in bringing these cases forward and pr providing sort of the mobilization and agency for these cases but also the domestic population at large. I think it often gets written out of the story as if the only kind of constituent audience is directly related to the crimes, but also we should kind of be thinking about, the states should be thinking about it as something that is uh, necessary and should be known to the domestic population as well. I think states have a really difficult time overall understanding or kind of conceptualizing and publicly kind of vocalizing the fact that these types of, of prosecutions are uh, in their national interest, not only in their international obligation. This is kind of some of the conversations that I had behind the scenes when we were talking, this is before the U um, Russian invasion. Um, so this is more 2014, 2015, um, when we talk about the first um, invasion of Russia into Eastern Ukraine that some of the kind of countries that might have been um, interested in uh, look, uh, pursuing opportunities for prosecution in uh, these uh, uh, situations ha have a very difficult time understanding that these, uh, that these cases can be responding to the needs and harms suffered by those people who are already residents in their own country, and therefore it is within their domestic interest to do so, right? It's always kind of couched in these kind of grand, more international terms. And I think that really shows in the way, for example, in the Anwar R case, the way in which the court is very narrowly conceptualizing its duties to uh, 
uh, publicize and make accessible the kind of proceedings of the, of the courts itself. I think there needs to be a shift in kind of conceptualization here to kind of understand that this is important for Germany as well, cases like Anwar R is important for Germany as well, and not just for Syrians and the international community. I think understanding that all of these three things are interlinked and therefore important as a domestic event is something that is politically urgent and very useful. Um, going forward, given the kind of overall political climate that we live in today. So what does that mean in terms of practical uh, steps? I think in terms of accessibility to victims as uh, victim communities, Patrick kind of covered this very nicely in his initial um, uh, uh, intervention. I would add on that, that perhaps there could be a greater attention, not just from civil society, but from the states themselves for public outreach, outreach to refugees who are entering into their country about avenues of accountability in their new country of residence. So we kind of already have a sense that these are these pathways are possible, people are much more willing to engage and have, know that they can engage in these processes if necessary. But I also think that there needs to be a greater outreach effort to the public of the prosecuting state generally, and not just the kind of narrow victim community, to uh, to disseminate the, the the records of the courts, the proceedings of the courts, and basically what is a story that is being told in the court. I think the people in those countries not only have the right, but uh, kind of benefit in knowing that the that these crimes have been committed that the that the domestic courts have taken up these uh, um, criminal prosecutions and in doing so understanding that the victims who have arrived within their borders are victims of these kind of particular kinds of harms i think this will do the domestic polity a great deal of benefit going forward in constituting a new form of political community that comes out of these universal jurisdiction cases I will leave it at that for the moment. I know that Melinda, you sent me a question from an audience who couldn't be here. I'm not sure if you wanted me to address this here or maybe during the Q&A, so I'll leave that up to, up to you. Yeah, let's do that after we've heard from Ibrahim. But thanks so much, Yina. Ibrahim, the floor is yours. Hi, good morning or good evening. I know this is cross continent and I and I apologize um, for not being able to make the full panel today. We had some sort of family emergencies that we're now dealing with. Um, but yeah, thanks for um, for inviting me and uh, and discussing. Obviously, you know, prior to the Anwar Raslan case, prior to the Dutch and uh, Canadian initiative, uh, prior to a, a number of uh, cases going on in, in Europe, this conversation would have been very different, uh, right? And I, I think there's been a turning point. Um, in, uh, in in a number of ways, um, both kind of strategically in terms of accountability, but also I think of interest, which I will kind of would like to focus on a little bit in my talk today, is the kind of Syrian reactions to things, right? The Syrian civil society, the Syrian NGOs, the Syrian victims, human rights actors, with regards to these um, uh, to, to these cases. Um, so I'll be focusing on two things. So I'll be focusing on the reactions to the to the Anwar Raslan case. And, and some of the reactions that, uh, that, that I've seen uh, uh, there and some of the debates that have been going into Syria uh, debates um, and the kind of Dutch Canadian uh, uh, initiative to hold Syria to account uh, through the torture convention, which is a, a diplomatic way of saying, um, you know, this is the first kind of uh, route uh, towards the International Court of Justice if negotiations and arbitrations uh, uh, fail, a case that I've been kind of actively involved in since its very beginning. Um, and the reason I'm using these two cases is one is a kind of a criminal universal um, kind of jurisdiction case, um, and the other one is an international civil case in a, in a, in a, in, in a kind of simplified uh, form, which triggered kind of different uh, uh, reactions because a lot of um, you know Syrian and Syrian victims have been talking about you know holding the regime to account, right? And and that's the kind of narrative that's been used. But then when that when that literally is being done uh, at the ICJ level, um, it, it has been for some not very kind of fulfilling because it's not criminal in nature. Um, but when it has been done uh, at a criminal level domestically with universal jurisdiction, it's also for some has not been fulfilling because it's against, you know, specific individuals because re regimes in abstract cannot be held criminally uh, uh, kind of uh, liable. So when um, I'll start with the ICJ case because that kind of started a little bit before uh, the, the the verdict came down in the in the Anwar uh, um, Raslan case, and um, and generally what um, what what happened there is as you know uh, the Netherlands first kind of invoked serious responsibility under the torture convention. Uh, this was then followed by uh, uh, Canada a few months uh, later, and they sent a kind of a common. 
uh, note uh, uh, verbal to uh, uh, to Syria. Um, the stage at the moment is in the kind of negotiation phase. Um, can't give too much details about where exactly it, it, it is, but it's a kind of a prerequisite to kind of arbitration and then going to the to the to the, to the International Court of Justice if all uh, fails. And um, uh, although it focuses on torture, which is also an international kind of crime, this is invoking um, uh, the tr a treaty right, right? This is invoking, uh, um, you know, it's, it's the same act, it's the same victims, uh, it's the same perpetrators, but coming at it from a kind of a, a civil uh, uh, perspective rather than a criminal in a kind of uh, penalizing sense, right? Um, and, and that brings me to my first point about how the international community, Syrians and their allies and, and so on, uh, view the word accountability. Right, because uh, these are very two different uh, two different uh, uh, forms, and obviously, as internet and you know, as as people who work on international law, we know that you know accountability for a lot of us is seems very much seen in the criminal sense. Um, but if we're focusing on kind of perpetrators, it's important to see the kind of regimes um, that Yona was kind of talking about um, uh, about what do they care about, where can they be held to account in 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 in, in that sense. Um, and in Syria's case, in my opinion, anything that helps consolidate the truth um, in light of the kind of disinformation that they've been putting, anything that would help delegitimize them as a, as a kind of a, a state, um, anything that would add economic pressure, further uh, create any sort of um, uh, isolation um, is, is a form of accountability, right? It's not necessarily that you have to lock up someone, but it, all these things play, um, play a different uh, uh, role. Um, it, it's a kind of a, a battle of points if, um, if, if uh, if you like. Um, and anything that kind of strengthens the victims, given that the regime has tried to silence them, anything that kind of, you know, uh, gets things in open court at the time where they're trying to hide, or to kind of focus on what the perpetrators have been trying to do, and anything that kind of disrupts that, um, in my opinion, is a form of, um, is a form of accountability. So in, in definitely the kind of move of the Netherlands and Canada helps achieve a lot of that, right? So it helps um, focus the narrative uh, on torture, it helps um, if it's strategically used um, to counter normalization, um, it's going to get a judgment uh, or uh, seeking a judgment from one of the most reputable uh, uh, courts that exist. A move that Ukraine and and you know has done in the very early days of, of the conflict, which was very interesting, with the judgment coming out, uh, I think it was yesterday or the or or, or the day before, um, and and so has a lot of uh, huge strategic benefits in, uh, uh, in 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 my opinion. Although some people would say, you know, we know Syria is committing torture, so what's the point of 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 taking matters to the to the ICJ and further kind of fragmenting the international system. But the reaction from, from some Syrians, I mean, uh, uh, the overwhelming um, kind of reaction that I've seen was, was supportive uh, from people that I have access to, but we've also seen some um, kind of uh, skeptical reactions, right, to, to this. So one, um, is, does, this, does this mean if there's a negotiation kind of element that there's normalization, the Netherlands and Canada don't have diplomatic ties, are they restoring diplomatic ties? Why are you giving the, you know, the why are you invoking a civil responsibility? This should be a crime. Um, uh, and so this kind of which is both lack of technical understanding but also kind of a policy consideration uh, were raised by uh, by some Syrian organizations which, which created um, a healthy debate uh, about <coughs> how accountability works and how impunity or the fight against impunity can uh, 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 can work, you know. Um, what we've seen is that victims are very happy to kind of engage with the process. A lot of them have given kind of evidence and witness statements to um, uh, uh, to the Netherlands and, uh, and and Canada to kind of you know uh, create the basis in terms of knowledge uh, uh, for them. But we did see, as I said, some skepticism about what will you negotiate on. This is torture, you know. What what do you mean negotiations in 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 that sense? What, what do you mean, you know, uh, uh, reparations or you know confirming that torture is being committed? We know Syria is being committed and, and so on, uh, or torture is being committed in, in Syria and so on. So that was kind of an, an interesting reaction that uh, that we got that triggered a healthy, uh, a, a healthy debate. And we did say, you know, if you're talking about holding the regime to account as a whole, this is the way to do it, right? This is, this is you're saying Syria, you're not saying an, in specific individuals uh, uh, in it. And that definitely can trigger complementarity with universal jurisdiction. It can uh, uh, kind of uh, help with prosecutors with evidence and so on to say, look, the ICJ has you know confirmed that torture is being committed. If it does so, uh, to say, you know, look, there there is a strong body of evidence. You don't just have to rely now on specific witnesses or you know human rights organizations or even the UN. You have you have a much bigger kind of court with a higher, arguably higher standard of of, um, of evidence to be able to look uh, uh, into that. 
With the case of Anwar Raslan, obviously this also created um, a, a different issue, right? It created the issue of this is a very specific case up against a very specific individual. Um, uh, the, the issue of that he defected, didn't defect is a different debate. I will leave, I'll leave that out of the story. Are we are not encouraging people to defect anymore? Is the regime in Damascus laughing and saying, look what happens when you leave me? You should have aligned yourself with me because I will fight. I will see this through the end. Look at those people who play, you know, uh, uh, heroism and uh, and defect. Look what happens to them. I have very different views to 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 those, but I will not get into them uh, uh, for now. But the the main the main debate around Anwar Raslan was um, those who saw the strategic value of this, and so and those who just saw it from a very simple litigation point of view. So strategic litigation versus litigation in 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 that sense. Um, and obviously, for the kind of crimes he was charged with, you know, a lot of people are saying there, there, there is no justice. Uh, those believers would say, you know, there is, there is divine justice. You cannot even get justice, you know, if, uh, uh, you know, if your son or daughter got hit by a car down the street. Let alone kind of the amount of crimes that were committed on a kind of systematic nature. But at least it's, it's a kind of a, a step for, uh, uh, for something. And so they kind of saw it in a very narrow uh, frame of things. But then those of us who saw it in a strategic value, and those who kind of read the judge judgments, listened to them, looked at them, and saw how the court, um, very gratefully, I would say, um, attributed responsibility to the entire system, to the entire apparatus, to the entire regime, saw the huge strategic value of that. I think the court over and over said, you are one person in a wider system. Um, and thank you for the great lawyers who kind of pushed for that. You know, I know Patrick is, is with us and, and, and the victims who kind of pushed, pushed for this. Um, because, you know, the, the, the judgment and, 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 a pre, and a press statement, I rarely see here in the UK courts issuing press statements on, 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 on things, but they did. And they talked about the Arab Spring and they talked about the Al-Assad regime and they talked about, um, you know, the, the, the security apparatus and, and, and all of that. And all of this, if strategically used, would be very kind of useful in, 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 in accountability in, 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 um, in that sense. Um, and so the, the two things that, and I'll finish quickly on that, the, the two things that link the, the kind of reaction to the ICJ and the reactions to Anwar Raslan, both taking kind of very different form. There's There we have individual complaints. Here we have a, a state action. This is a domestic court. This is international court. This is universal jurisdiction, criminal. This is civil under, under a torture convention is to see accountability one as not constrained to just who, how many people do I lock up and how am I able to do that, but seeing it from a kind of much wider lens about what kind of annoys perpetrators and what kind of stands up for, uh, for, for, for victims, what helps consolidate the narrative, what helps to fight disinformation and, uh, and, and, and so on. And then the second thing is to be able to see through a strategic lens um, and not a binary lens, not a, like zero and one justice, no justice, accountability, no accountability, but rather as a battle of points where you kind of try and score as much points as, as you can um, in, in the fight against impunity, in kind of calling for justice rather than achieving justice, because I, I, I don't think justice is achievable. I don't think full accountability is, is, is achievable in light of the gravity and the scale of crimes in Syria, but at least to turn, you know, the nouns into verbs and say, this is, you know, what we're working towards in, um, in, in, in that sense, and seeing them from, from any sort of strategic value that they can, that, that they can add. And that might be looking beyond this to the very kind of narrow lens of, you know, who is this case against? Are they invited to negotiations? This is a case against Anwar Raslan, not the regime, all of that, and, and trying to find ways uh, and that, that's our duties, right? That's not the duty of the states. That's not, that's not the duty of the courts. That's the duty of those who've taken upon themselves to kind of fight against impunity in Syria to find strategic added values of, 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 of these cases while continuing the healthy debates that have been going kind of amongst uh, uh, civil society. So um, I'll leave it at that and I'll be happy to stay if there's any kind of any sort of uh, uh, questions on, on the points I raised. And again, I apologize again for, for being late. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ibrahim. Um, there is probably one question I'd be keen to, to get your response on, and I just wanted to put it to the whole to whole group before I, I ask anybody else to open it up, and that's from Mansour Amari, who um, unfortunately was not able to make it today um, because he, due to ill health, um, but who was a victim of torture, and anybody that's seen Sarah Afshar's film uh, series disappeared, um, he, he, which he's in. And so I'll just read his message, which is that unfortunately, I'm not participating in activities currently for health reasons. But I, what I can say now is that this is an important event and I hope for more insight and in-depth look into the Syria quest for justice experience 
including the punitive deterrent component of justice, not only the path to legal action, but its outcome and the actual impact to the perpetrators. So I'd like to just open that up to the round table before I open it up to others. Go Patrick. You now also unmuted, so I'll give her the floor first. Okay. <laughs> no, I just wanted to ask what order we're going in on this. Okay, so very briefly, uh, this is more of a speculation than than in terms of actual kind of empirical analysis about what's happening on the ground in Syria, but in broader theories about how deterrence works from political science suggests that in order for criminal prosecution to have a deterrent effect, it needs to go hand in hand with what we call social deterrence. So states or kind of perpetrator um, regimes or states will need to have some kind of desire for legitimacy vis-a-vis -a, -vis a particular group of audience in order for this kind of prosecution to have a very noticeable um, deterrent effect, right? Just the, the fact that you are locking people up or kind of saying that your regime is responsible in these big forums, that in and of itself has limited effect in the way that the, the perpetrators act um, uh, on the ground. This is kind of what, what, what people have said from other contexts. And if we kind of take the um, context of universal jurisdiction cases into account then, how would the social deterrence actually work? So far, we've only really looked at international prosecution. So it would, the, the question was always pitched in the broadest form of, does this state or these group of uh, people or political organization want to be accepted by the international, criminal, uh, international community writ large? And does that have some kind of effect in how they interpret the outcome of the trial? But, now, but that kind of side obviously continues to exist, but now that the trial has come to a different state, so the relationship is not only multilateral, but bilateral. So is there, is there a role to be played, uh, is there a bilateral kind of relationship uh, role to be played in the social deterrence of perpetrators when it comes to uh, the effect of the prosecutions? So in going forward, this is again, you know, high, just speculating, does it actually matter for Syria that the Anwar our case was being prosecuted in Germany, as opposed to some country that they might care less about in terms of bilateral relations, right? Um, that most of these cases are happening in Europe. Does that have a positive or negative or kind of different kind of effect on the way Syrian perpetrators might act going forward, um, given that they're European and there's all, all sorts of different kind of relationship that might be, uh, we can kind of speculate about that. Um, again, kind of looking into the future kind of beyond Syria, if we're kind of thinking about Ukraine, Russia, for example, does it matter that it is the US maybe that is supporting these efforts or is it, does it matter that it comes from Europe or it comes from other parts of the world? So I think um, this kind of universal jurisdiction gives us this kind of more disaggregated manner of thinking about what can be the, the mechanism of deterrence uh, for from stemming from prosecution alone. Thanks, Yina. Patrick, did you want to jump in and then Tariq and then Mibraham, if they want to. Sure. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I think there are several levels, several, or there are several levels of answers to this question. I think um, when you speak about the actual impact on perpetrators, and this is something that I said in my first uh, intervention, I think, you know, from our perspective, it's also really important, and that's what we focus on right now, what's the actual impact of the survivors or of the people that have actually been subjected to this state torture because they have been made, I mean, this is essentially what this crime of torture does. It makes you the object of state violence and it puts you into a completely you know, helpless state vis-a-vis -vis this, uh, this, this force and this violence. And what we try to do with our work and what ideally you know, this work should look like, it should be, I mean, I don't like the word empowering because I think the people that we are working with, they are powerful enough already, you know, but still there are some uh, some roads, so to say, to be paid for them to be able to do this. And this is really what has happened, you know, what I meant with this moment when the, when the co-plaintiffs, you know, were giving their closing arguments. At that point in time, they were subjects again. They were subjects with individual rights demanding justice again. And I think this is a very powerful thing to happen. And obviously, you know, and that's why we're, we're the whole issue of, of outreach and accessibility is becoming so important. And actually, it's interesting because Mansour was very much implied in that. He was one of the people 
uh, you know, that actually went with our support to the constitutional court in Germany saying, I'm an accredited Syrian, I need to have access to translation. And, uh, and, and he won it basically, but this is where it becomes so important. So that this feeling is actually also being transferred to others. And that's why also it's so important that you have more than just these, these, these few cases, but that you, that you continue to work on them. Um, however, and I think this is really important also that we stay realistic in what we are able to achieve and what we aren't. Uh, and this also goes to, uh, to what you said in the beginning, Ibrahim, uh, I mean, putting the regime on trial. I mean, in a way, of course, we have a, you know, a crimes against humanity case, and it is a lot about the contextual element. And you, you know, you read hundreds of pages probably in the upcoming verdict uh, against Anwar Raslan, uh, you know, on these aspects, et cetera, and already in the, in the press release you do. Um, but nevertheless, it's important to understand that, yeah, justice for these kind of crimes probably is just never, you know, achievable. Uh, but what we, you know, can do in order to stay, you know, subjects and stay active and, and not, you know, basically uh, give in to this massive violence uh, that, that the Syrian state is exercising, um, is that we continue to do that. And, and each step, we at least get closer to a goal that we will never achieve. Uh, but I think it's important to make that clear uh, and not kind of sell it to people, you know, as if it will happen. I mean, you know, look at the ICTY with all the billions of dollars it had to spend. Um, and if you then ask around in former Yugoslavia, no one is really satisfied with that kind of justice because how can you have justice for genocide? It's actually, uh, you know, probably not, not possible. Um, however, I still want to also speak about another kind of effect. And this has also been mentioned before, um, also by you, Yuna, uh, that we see also with this case, but also with the kind of overall threat that this hopefully poses, uh, you know, to high level perpetrators, especially to high level perpetrators. Um, that is on the one hand, you know, you can kind of counter a narrative as also you said, Ibrahim, you know, towards normalization, you know, uh, especially Germany would be a kind of country that would very soon after such, you know, horrible crimes would try to open, uh, you know, pave the ways for their, for their own enterprises to, to do business again, you know, and build, rebuild roads uh, and whatnot and, and make business basically and reestablish diplomatic ties and so on and so forth. And, and by having, you know, uh, this, uh, this verdict now, um, I think, uh, you know, it's, we set the bar much higher for this kind of normalization to, uh, to happen. Um, but also beyond that, you know, only with the arrest warrants, uh, I think, you know, the case of Jamil Hassan, uh, for example, who was in a Beirut hospital because of multiple heart attacks reportedly. Um, and when Germany demanded his extradition and the U.S. kind of backed him on that, uh, I mean, I don't know if it was, you know, if there was a causal link between the two, but actually, I mean, at least right afterwards, he was reported to be outside of that country again. And that was Lebanon, you know, and he's much less secure uh, in any other country, but Iran, uh, Lebanon, uh, or, uh, or any other in the region, you know, and normally this is something that even when we speak about, for example, to, you know, name the, the, the highest level, so to say, of power that you can maybe have on that level, members of the former Bush administration, that are only wanted as witnesses in the cases, you know, for the for the for the U.S. torture program post 9/11, they don't actually travel to Europe anymore because they know that they might be interrogated, and even you know who knows what might happen afterwards. Um, and normally in these kind of cases, you know, these these persons they always want to some point in time, uh, you know, go skiing in Switzerland or go visit a niece who studies in Paris. Um, and and by already just imposing that again, you know, I'm I'm speaking from a civil society perspective and. We don't have these massive, you know, tools of state violence in our hands, but that's a little tiny thing that we can do. We say, you cannot do anything you want to people. We do have tools and we try to use them as much as we can. Although ultimately, of course, um, they're they are limited, but we're not gonna cease using them basically. And that will hopefully have an effect. Uh, Ibrahim, um, I'll let you go next because I know you have to get back to your family. Thank you so much. Um, and I'll just be very, very uh, uh, brief. Um, so I think, um, you know, what, what Patrick has been talking about, about victims and, um, and, and the impact that has on them, absolutely. Um, what, um, you know, the impact on, on accountability and holding the perpetrators to account, absolutely. Deterrence? I don't, I don't think so. Um, I, I don't think deterrence mm -hmm. in the Syrian case, in terms of the, these cases, made any sense because I think the the hypothesis of uh, of the regime, and this is just from my from my analysis, it's my opinion, is that if I double down, 
I will make it far more difficult to be able to be held to account. Um, so I will overload the system. I will commit so many different crimes at so many different levels. Um, it, 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 the, the narrative will be so complicated that, that organizations and groups and victims would not know where to start uh, uh, with this. They'll feel overwhelmed. They'll feel there's nothing called justice. They'll feel tired. They will give up. They'll be depressed and so on. We have been able to prove that theory wrong that no we, we're not going to kind of give up and 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 in that sense but i genuinely think with the syrian regime that was the kind of uh, attitude towards things because they were not hiding away they were filming the barrel bombs they were bragging about the bombings they were um you know taking the pictures uh, all, all all of these things uh, like even a kind of a, a military for a photographer like caesar like if, if you were committing such crimes you would not allow a position of caesar to exist in in in, in, in that sense why would you have someone kind of filming what's going on and take and and, and taking pages Obviously, Obviously, that's what we've seen, um, and I'm sure there's a lot of things that that that, um, that that we haven't. So I think deterrence for the Syrian regime. I don't think that that would be an impact for for uh, uh, of accountability. But I think, as uh, as difficult as it is for me to, as uh, a Syrian to say, it might be deterrence for other conflicts. It might be deterrence for Yemen. It might be deterrence for Libya. It might be deterrence now for Ukraine. Uh, but I don't think in the Syrian case it's deterrence. Yes, it's accountability for. for to a large extent, yes, it's it's stopping normalization or assisting in the in the fight against normalization. Yes, it's supporting victims and giving them the moment of truth. It's a big, massive battle, but on the deterrence point, and and that's something that I've kind of read over and over in, in, in kind of governmental strategies that started, you know, very early on the European Union started putting huge amount of money in 2012 and 2013 towards accountability efforts at a time uh, arguing that this will create deterrent rather than working on other ways to kind of create prevention of, of, of those crimes. The call for accountability, in my opinion, came much earlier than it should in, in, in um, from the West because it's an easier thing to do. It's, um, it's uh, you know, more safe, more politically sound and, uh, and, and, and all of that. And I think that was a missed opportunity that led to a lot of the crimes being committed in, in Syria, unfortunately. Thank you, Ibrahim, and uh, I'll, I'll say goodbye to you. Thank you so much. Tariq, did you want to jump in? I'll, I'll be very brief, just to pick up um, uh, both Ibrahim and, and Patrick's point about uh, really uh, the need to be realistic about um, the expectations um, that we think these tribunals or processes can fulfill. And I fully endorse everything that's been said. Um, uh, one aspect, uh, to sort of put a, a, a slightly, um, perhaps a, a, a positive um, spin on things, and not, not so much spin, but hopefully also um, substance, uh, is the importance of a historical record that's created by these processes. And as Patrick reminds us, these judgments contain hundreds of pages of analysis of contextual uh, events, uh, that analysis is subject uh, and is the product of one of the most uh, forensic processes available to us as a you know, society of humans. Um, this material undergoes a, a high level of scrutiny. It's only accepted by a court uh, if it can be established to a high degree of authenticity and reliability. The conclusions of these courts, um, I would like to think, will withstand the test of time and hopefully contribute to a, um, a realistic, objective, accurate record of events, which at least for those particular regions, um, so putting aside the deterrent effect and other, and of course the importance for victims, but just in terms of, um, I suppose, uh, whether it be reconciliation or whatever a, an accurate historical record contributes to um, a, a healthy society, I think these tribunals and, and the records they produce are do perform that important function as feeding into that process. Thank you. Thank you, Tara. Um, I just wanted to ask if anybody wanted to, oh, okay, so Beth has uh, asked a question, um, and if anybody else wants to put it in the chat. So the first question is, does universal jurisdiction have equal legitimacy across states from other states? Does a ruling inside a state alter legal precedent internationally? Patrick, would you like to have a go at that one? Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, it doesn't have, you know, uh, the effects of to to start with that part of the question of a of a precedent uh, in the you know especially uh, common law sense that anyway is um, is not you know a concept that is as strong in continental or in civil law systems. Um, so 
I mean, even in Germany, for that reason, right? Uh, it, it it doesn't set a precedent, you know, to the degree that you know, if if there is if there is a ruling already established that you that there's you know very difficult, you would make it very difficult for another court to deviate from that. However, um, it does carry a lot of uh, authoritative weight, uh, and I think I mean there are you know very uh, interesting studies being made, and and you know this is probably Yuna, you know, who knows much more about that about the networking of international. Uh, you know, jurisprudence and international jurisprudence, etc. So there is a lot of, um, um, yeah, cross fertilization, I would say, and a lot of cross reference to it, uh, that already, you know, the um, criminal tribunals also, they also refer, you know, to similar cases that have been adjudicated, first of all, on the international level, but since we're speaking about universal jurisdiction, and it's clear that it all basically is based on the Rome statute and the definition of crimes there, uh, we will see it a lot more also on these factors. So already now, I know that, for example, French courts are looking into what German courts are doing on some specific aspects. And, 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 and increasingly, we have professionals also, you know, that, that, that can think, you know, so internationally. And so I think that it kind of depends, you know, on, and this is very like informally, you know, how, how high basically uh, you value a decision of a specific court, you know, how high the esteem, so to say, uh, for a specific uh, judiciary is is in a different country, uh, but I, I would say um, and and hope uh, thinking of how at least the German constitutional court is very often referred to internationally, at least in the European Union, but also beyond uh, that. For a German court, it's clear that the standards are relatively high. That you know there are several um, there are seven seven uh, professional judges that have heard the evidence and so on and so forth. Uh, so I do think uh, that despite the fact that there is no um, precedent effect in, in the narrow sense uh, that, that it does have a lot of uh, effects um, uh, to courts, investigations, but as I said, also hopefully political decisions in the future, um, again, depending on, on how that's being evaluated by the individual system. And for that reason, I think yet it does, it does make a difference um, where this, this judgment is coming from. That's why transparency is so important, because mm -hmm. if you see that's, that a verdict is based on uh, you know, a fair uh, and 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 professionally led proceeding, uh, then you know others will also um, attribute it more more weight than internationally. Um, we just have one more question from Sana before we finish, um, which is in relation to accountability for health related crimes, meaning bombing of hospitals and targeting of hospitals. I'm not sure if um, Tariq, you want to have a crack at that. And yeah, look, I mean. Uh... I will perhaps uh, come in here to just clarify my statement because I was just writing. Uh, I pressed the uh, enter without uh, before I managed to complete the question. So, you know, thank you, everyone. Uh, the last time uh, violence against the healthcare was uh, successfully prosecuted was in 1992, um, Serb attack on a hospital in Croatia. And, um, and uh, you know, it's been 30 years of attacks on healthcare that have gone uh, essentially uh, uh, unpunishable. Um, and the question is, you know, with the massive record that we have in Syria of, uh, of violence against healthcare, obviously, I'm interested in this because I'm a health, uh, health uh, worker and a health researcher. So I'm interested in, in the opinions of the colleagues uh, about the... Um, about the uh, uh, the possibility of uh, of accountability for health related uh, uh, for violence against healthcare that's number one um, and uh, taking into account the the issues of uh, uh, proving the chain of command and also the claims of uh, both Syrian and Russian uh, regimes of uh, of the use of these facilities by terrorists and whatnot so that's number one. The second question that I have concerns um, uh, the uh, Ala uh, Musa trial and the, the fact that we have uh, now another type of a health related crime. This is the, u the, the use of the health facilities as, crime, as sites of torture and uh, maybe, uh, uh, maybe killing. And also the, um, the participation of health workers um, as, as, as in, in, in torture and crime. And the question is, you know, how do you as experts in law view the difference between um, uh, the Anwar Raslan trial and the Ala Musa trial? I mean, I, you see, uh, to me, um, to me as a, as a non-specialist, I know how I view it. But the question is, from your perspective, how do you uh, review the difference between these two types of trials? 
and uh, and what does this mean um, uh, uh, in terms of uh, accountability efforts? So over to you. I'm happy to have a go, uh, Melinda, and then uh, again, happy to see the floor to people um, like more qualified to to um, to answer the question. But uh, thank you, Summer. I mean, I um, would say, well, as, as clearly you and others on this panel um, understand the targeting of hospitals or the use of torture in a hospital facility are all capable of being prosecuted as crimes against humanity or in some circumstances as war crimes. There's, there's really no difference between targeting the hospital or targeting the childcare centre or targeting a, a residential building. Um, there certainly could be a difference in terms of gravity and the type of the infliction of, of, of injury that might result. Uh, but these are all um, civilian facilities that are not legitimate targets under international humanitarian law. Um, it, it, it becomes, it's interesting because often in these trials, we see, and now we see it, we see the echoes of it now in the Ukraine, tragically enough, where the, the side that the, the, the group that might be described as perpetrators will allege that they're responding to, to um, attacks from those facilities. It's, it's so predictable. The exact same claim was made in relation to the siege of Sarajevo. Um, the exact same claim was made in Croatia. Now it's being made in the Ukraine. It is so, it is such a worn out and easily disproven um, claim that it really comes down to proof at trial and, and you wouldn't worry if you looked at what's happening, for example, in Ukraine at the moment, or what was happening in Syria, the sort of widespread uh, it's um, shelling of civilian um, targets, that there's no claim of, of responding to uh, an attack could, could possibly stand up in a court. The challenge is to bring them to court. And in terms of proof, um, you know, there's the, there's the, the um, the phrase slam dunk, you wouldn't find a lot of difficulty proving an attack on a hospital as a, as a crime against humanity. And similarly, the use of torture in a, in a hospital facility, um, obviously a different kind of um, a crime. What, what I was reminded of, Simon, when you asked that question was um, in international, in customary international law, there is a mode of liability described as joint criminal enterprise, which I'm, I'm sure you and others have heard about. Um, but where essentially it's not applicable at the International Criminal Court under its statute, there are similar concepts. But um, under customer international law, the concept of joint criminal enterprise has three variants. Um, and it's essentially all three are to do with a group of people agreeing to commit a crime and then committing a crime or something along those lines. Um, the second variant of joint criminal enterprise is called systematic joint criminal enterprise. And that would be the one that would most be the most suitable, it seems to me, to a setting such as a hospital where torture is being practiced, assuming it's practiced on an ongoing basis, where you've got a system of abuse that is in place and people contribute to that system. And it would actually, a, a liability to, would extend potentially not only to people who are inflicting the torture, the actual torturers, but people who are managing the facility, uh, to extend to people like guards. Um, as you say, doctors or others who are enabling the system to continue. Um, just finally, one example of that, although these people weren't uh, prosecuted in Cambodia, but within the context of um, security centres, there were medical staff who were keeping the detainees alive so their torture could continue. Um, so unfortunately, uh, humanity seems... There's no end to the ingenuity of humanity, it seems to me, when it comes to inflicting horrible suffering um, and international law would be able to respond uh, the question of getting them to court and, and, and getting the right evidence. Thank you. Thank you. Um, unfortunately, we're out of time and I noted that uh, Azada has written something in there. So I might just forward that to the team and if they can, if one of them could get back to you, because that's a very, very good question um, in relation to Norway. Um, but I'd like to thank the speakers, Patrick Croker, Tariq Abdullah, Ibrahim Alabi, and Yuna Han for speaking to us tonight. And thank you, everybody, for, for coming, um, and good night. Thank you. See you later. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone. I put the link in the chat. There is a, an event on Tuesday that will also be live streamed in case it's uh, interesting for people. So. Um, the information is oh, in the I'm, chat to this. Great. Yeah, I'm going to that. I'll, I'll see you there. <laughs> okay, great. <laughs> Take <Thanks>. care. <laughs> bye bye. Bye.